My name is Glenn Woods. Thanks for joining me. Bold Republic is on the air. And if I have this all correct, this should be Charles Curley from Wyoming Liberty Group on the phone right now. Is that you, Charles? Yes, it is, Glenn. It's good to talk to you. Good to talk to you. Glad to have you on. I remember, uh, was it? I forget, some months ago, I came across a gentleman from Utah who was a representative who spoke along with Liz Cheney here in Gillette. And he talked about a clever little plan to basically use eminent domain on a state level to take land from the federal government because he said the federal government was violating a deal that was made. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And after his speech, I got into a conversation with him about, and I got the story in front of me because Reason Magazine just picked up that story. And I got into a conversation with him about it. And his situation over in Utah is a little bit different than the situation here in Wyoming. So have you been working on this? Have you been writing about this here in the state of Wyoming? I'm just getting started. I'm getting up to speed on it. I'm learning a lot. And uh, let me tell you what, Utah is leading the pack on this, but 40% of their state budget is federal money. That's the problem they're going to come across because they're yeah. getting federal money. on the. Uh, well, the other yeah, side yeah. of that, though, is underneath the land in Utah is a lot of natural resources that they could use if they could get at it. Well, yeah, and that's the key thing. You go up to North Dakota and you want to drill for uh, natural gas, you can get a permit from the state and from private landholders in a very short period of time, under two months. You go on to BLM land, you're looking at 18 months minimum, and that's if you get it. Yeah. All right, yeah. now let's back up for those people who are listening in Wyoming. And by the way, we also have listeners over in South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, so and part of Nebraska. So some of these surrounding states are in a similar situation. A lot of people have called this show, Charles Dorn, the course of the years that I've been on out here in the West, and have said to me, well, but isn't the land here in Wyoming ours? How did the federal government get it? And the answer is they have the cart before the horse. The federal government had it first. Is that right? Well, kind of, sort of. Yeah, okay. Um, you go back. Okay. The process for becoming a state is, you know, you're a territory first. Right. And Congress can split up territories and rearrange them and mix and match and whatnot. And then normally Congress passes an enabling act. And that says to the states, okay, you can start the process for becoming a state. You can write a state constitution. You can have a plebiscite to approve it, et cetera. And then they do all this, and Congress looks at that and gives it its blessing, and that's called an act, and the Admission Act. They've got two separate acts of Congress. And as part of the Enabling Act, two things happen. One, the state gives up all claim to public lands in the state. So the people who are saying that, no, this is all federal land and we gave it up when we became a state, are reading that. But you look at the very next sentence and it says, until such time as the federal government extinguishes all title, in other words, sells it off, gives it away, whatever, transfers it, and you start reading further into this, the feds made a contract with the states that they would turn that land over to the states. And they've already done this in most of the states. Draw a line through the United States, basically on the eastern boundary of Colorado or Wyoming. All the states east of that land the feds have title to very small chunks of it, 3%, 5%, whatever. West of that line, and this includes Colorado, Wyoming, California, 11 states, west of that line, the feds control huge amounts of it. I think it's something like 60% in Utah, 90%, uh, I believe, in Nevada, etc. And uh, just to give one example, one of those states is California. Can you imagine what California could do to improve its budget situation if they controlled what are now federal lands? Well, yeah, and of course, I also kind of wonder if California would because they tend to. Well, yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, it, it I, might just I, enable in continuing the California welfare. State. But yeah, but they could though. You're right. Okay, but let me let me get to that part because I believe the representative I'm talking to, I think, is 
His name was Ken Ivory. Okay, that and, think, yeah, he's been spearheading this thing, and I'll get to an organization he's put together in a minute. But okay, but I was w wondering, could you focus for just a minute on what was this deal that you just mentioned, where the federal government at some point was supposed to give up the land ownership, turn it back over to us? I mean, how exactly did that contract work, and are they violating it? Well, originally... Uh, go back to the adoption of the Constitution, and even before that, the Northwest Ordinance, and the whole intent was originally to pay off the Revolutionary War debt by selling off the public lands, and this they did in the Northwest Territory, which is which uh, is you know, states in the, what used to be the Northwest, I, or, um, Illinois. Uh, Indiana, Ohio, etc. And so they they took what had been federal land and they privatized it or they turned it over to states and the states then privatized it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, that was the start of it. And then similarly in what became the southern states. But when they got to further west, the feds balked. It's, I don't think we want to do this. So around 1828, a bunch of states got together. They looked at the enabling acts. They looked at the admit acts of admission. They looked at the law, and they said, hey, we got a contract. And the Fed said, uh, er, oop, mumble, mumble. Right. Yeah, well, there's a contract here. Okay, we'll give you the land. Now, since then, the Feds have tried to change the law um, they said, nope, we're changing the policy, and the policy now is we're going to hang on to the federal lands, and in compensation to the states for hanging on to the federal land, we're going to do, among other things, what we call payment in lieu of taxes, and that started in the 1970s. The feds pay to the states uh, what a private landholder would pay if the private landholder had that land. So, for example, uh, Natrona County, with a $40 million budget, they get uh, 2 or $3 million for their budget from the feds in lieu of taxes. Mm. Well, here's the problem. Law says, and this is contract law 101, a party to a contract cannot unilaterally change it. It takes both, both parties. Right. The feds technically have violated the contract with that. And furthermore, they're not even keeping up their part of their idea of what the contract is now. Uh, I don't know if you saw in the Casper Star Tribune recently, but the feds have cut payment in lieu of taxes to Wyoming by more than 50%. Right. Yeah, That's I did. I posted that on my regional page on, on my website. So, boy, By the way, everybody, I'm talking to... Charles Curley is with Wyoming Liberty Group. I uh, wondered, though, when they cut that, can anybody file a lawsuit? I mean, there is there any? Can, can you drag them to court on this one? I don't know. My suspicion is no, because it's done by act of Congress. Mm. And if you accept that Congress can modify their half of the contract unilaterally, then there probably is nothing we can do. I think our best bet is to say, and this is, again, Contract Law 101. If one side of a contract violates that contract, the other side is released from all obligation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those of you who rent apartments are very much aware that if you don't pay your rent, the, the landlord can throw you out. Right. And that's an application of what I just described. Well, <clears throat> if the feds aren't keeping up their part of the contract, we can take our land back. Okay, now that brings in to play the whole mess, and this is where Utah may wind up in, with, with a bit of a problem. So let's say they take this action, they take the land back. Well, now the problem is they get so much money from the federal government for various projects, Utah could wind up broke. Yeah, and I don't know the figures on Utah's budget, but... And, oh, I have to give you compliments, Glenn. Mm -hmm. I just looked at your reading assignment page, and down at the very bottom, you've got an article from uh, J.D. Chichilli mm -hmm. that reads right. a magazine on exactly this issue. Right. I and, do my homework. I tell you, I do my homework on this. 
Well, you certainly did on that, and I, and and uh, I have to say, I knew J.D. Chutilly yeah. when he was knee high, and I knew his father Jerry when he was running for governor of New York. Oh, wow! So, yeah, so I have a lot of respect for J.D. I think he does great work. Well, it's an interesting article that while we're talking, I have it right in front of me. This is where um, you know, I read it a couple of times before I pulled you on the air here, just because this is important in information for the state of Utah, but then let's get back into the state of Wyoming. How does it play out here? Because on the one hand, they take royalties for us and they're supposed to send us our cut back, but they don't. Yeah, we saw what happened with that, with the mineral uh, fees last year. It took our entire congressional delegation, all three of them, to browbeat the feds what? into paying us the money. Just a side note on that. I mean, and then we'll get back to the topic. I often thought a great solution is we take our royalties first and send them the difference. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Yeah. It, it would certainly save us the uh, usual federal handling fee of 50%. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but, yeah. <laughs> but so it's mafia. I mean, we're, we're dealing with the mafia at this point. But, okay, let's get back to land here in the state of Wyoming. And if you know anything about the surrounding states, I want to ask about some of those as well. But, okay, so here in the state of Wyoming – is there anything we can do that's similar to the state of Utah? Are we in a position that's similar to them? Well, I, I think we're in a better position, but one of the things that uh, we need to do is do a study of how Wyoming is funded. Unfortunately, you can't just look at the annual budget bill and say, okay, this is federal money, this isn't, and add it all up. Right. It's a mess. So that's one of the things Wyoming Liberty Group... I, you know, or somebody needs to look into is what's our federal funding and where's it coming from and where's it going. But uh, a good place to start would be with the education money, because yeah, yeah. you know, with with federal money comes federal regulations, and that means federal compliance. That's one of the reasons why I've been opposed to this state accepting programs like Common Core. Okay. Well, I've talked to two different state superintendents of education, mm -hmm. Cindy Hill, whom you know, and Jim McBride, who preceded right. her. And both of them told me that the feds fund education in Wyoming to somewhere around 9 or 10 percent. Right. And again, we've got to look at the figures. We've got to see what the school districts are doing and so on. So that's a good guesstimate. Yeah. Okay. If we get rid of the federal funding in the education, we also get rid of the mandates. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we lose 10%. It means we can take some of the money we're now spending on compliance and move it into actually teaching kids. Right. Okay, here's the inside joke between you and me, see how many listeners can get this one. So they could always threaten to take away our highway funds, which they never send. <laughs> Well, you know, it just so happens, and here's my response to exactly that. Yeah. You want to take away our highway funds? Fine. We're going to stop plowing Interstate 80 between the Nebraska line and the Utah line. Right. Who uses that more, Wyomingites or out-of-staters? Yeah. You want to bring commerce between Colorado and Utah to a screeching halt? Sure, this would do it. But, and, and my point, though, is you know, here's... They're not sending us, and I remember this with a, with a couple of legislative sessions we just had, they're not sending us the highway money that they're supposed to be ha sending us, so we're trying to find a way to pave federal roads. So why would such a threat bother us? Well, <laughs> a very good point. And, you know, okay, I know a lot of people in Wyoming don't like the idea of towing the interstates. And right. You know, I, I sympathize with that, but I got to tell you something, and, and full disclosure here, I am a shareholder in a company called Road King. Okay. It, it's traded on the Hang San Exchange in Hong Kong. They own 1,100 kilometers of highways, bridges, and other infrastructure in the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. If we can, if the People's Republic of China can have privately held highways, yeah. why can't Wyoming? There you go. Hang on to that thought. I've got to pay a couple of bills. We'll be back in just a moment. Okay. Charles Curley, Wyoming Liberty Group. We'll finish up the conversation. Let's get back to the show. Here's Glenn Woods. And on the phone with me from Wyoming Liberty Group, and I believe you're down in Cheyenne. Is that right, Charles? Uh, actually, I'm, I'm uh, if you might, uh, to, to quite a euphemism out of the country, I'm in oh. Collins. Oh, okay. A good hideout. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Nobody's going to look for a real Wyoming night in Fort Collins. No, not a Charles Curley on the phone with me. He's with Wyoming Liberty Group. Let me ask you real quick about some of the surrounding states. And I know, uh, again, you're just starting to dig into this, but still, are some of the states like South Dakota, Montana, you know, North Dakota, Nebraska, are they in a similar situation as Wyoming and Utah? I think, well, I tell you what, the worst state off is Nevada. And uh, Wyoming is up there pretty high. Colorado's up there pretty high. Montana, not as bad. Now, North Dakota and South Dakota, uh, except for uh, reservations, are pretty much, they've pretty much recovered all their federal lands. Okay. Because they're east of that line I described. And if, I'll tell you what, if the listeners would like to look at a map that really gives it to you and see why, that, why I described that line, let me point your listeners to AmericanLandsCouncil.org. Yeah. AmericanLandsCouncil.org. And they've got a really nice graphic there. Uh, just It really makes the picture. You. Have you had a chance to talk with anyone at the Wyoming legislator about the possibility of the same kind of, um, let's call it what it is, land grab by the state of Wyoming as the state of Utah is trying to undertake right now? Well, I don't, we're not in uh, Utah's league yet, okay. but we could get there. Several, we have, you got a legislature's uh, website, they've got a web page of committees. And down toward the bottom, you know, they've got the regular interim committees and then the select committees, and then they've got task forces and stuff like that. There's a task force on the public lands. And probably the spark plug there is, uh, uh, I'm terrible at remembering names. No, oh, yeah, um, me too. Dave uh, from Fremont County, and I can't remember his name. Okay, well, he's from Fremont County anyway. Yeah, and he's pushing that. Uh, Eli Bebout, who's a senator from Fremont County, is also on that committee. Mm -hmm. And there's an interest in changing that from a special committee to a select committee, which doesn't really sound like much, but it kind of moves it up in the pecking order of committees. And they are very interested in what the American Lands Council and Ken Ivory are doing. And they see what you and I have just been talking about, and they see the advantage of at least moving on it. Okay. Well, and I look at this in several ways, but let's, let's take a look at it from someone who's at the state capitol, like a governor or a state representative. This could be a financial boom in taxpayer money coming into the state if they were to make a move like this? It could be. It, it has to be managed well. It has to be managed carefully, like anything in trust. Um, we, you know, we need to be very careful about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But that said, you know, we, all right, just to give one example, Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado, in the area where we're, those three states come together, they're sitting on something called the Green River Formation. And that formation alone has enough oil in it that uh, they matched what's available in the rest of the world. Yeah. I mean, you're, we we're talking recover. hundreds of years worth of oil in there. Yeah. If we can recover it. Well, that's yeah. mostly BLM land. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, we, we'd like that back, thank you. <laughs> yeah. What? Well, and so, I mean, I'm looking at it. The reason I mentioned it from the state capital point of view is, I'm trying to think of, to get our representatives moving on something like this, you want to get them salivating over money. Right. It, yeah. It's the That's exact same way that you get a private business to move on something. You get them to salivate over money, and all of a sudden, it's a good idea. Well, yeah. As you well know from the fuel tax increase last year, wave money under their noses, and you get their attention. Yeah. So, yeah, and there's revenue there to be had. You know, if, if, we, if we take the lands from the feds, we can privatize some of it. Now we've got land on the tax rolls. We can manage other parts of it uh, similar to what BLM does, but we can manage it better. I mean, yeah, we're here in Wyoming. They are. Yeah. Well, and it's an interesting strategy because you and I look at it from a freedom and liberty, get the federal government out of our lives strategy. But in order to do that, we have to appeal to the waving money under their nose strategy. Right. 
Yeah. Well, and we have to be fiscally responsible. That's with it. true. I do not want to go down the road of Greece or California or Washington. Well, and uh, and I got just a few seconds. I got to wrap it up with you. But it, another thing that environmentalists would worry about a move like this, we would take care of the land better than the federal government because you know we've got to drink that water, we've got to breathe that air. We live here. Yeah, for Pete's sake. Hey, it's been great having you on, Charles. I got to run to a hard break. I hope to have you on again. On this same topic, as it develops, let me know and we can continue the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Glenn.